As a rule, I don't rush to keep this channel apace of all the latest developments in astronomy and planetary science. Not that I'm not interested in such things. Far from it. It's simply that my somewhat verbose writing style is better suited to the kinds of long-form, historical, exploratory works you usually see from me. I like to let a topic simmer for a while before I taste it. Besides, there are already plenty of excellent YouTubers who cover these topics. Check my subscriptions. And it's always better to find your own niche. I do intend to make the best of list an annual tradition, in which I consolidate all the news stories I would have covered into one giant literary expectoration. So look out for that come January. I do, however, make an exception whenever a recent development impacts a story I have already covered, particularly this one. My video on Proxima B remains by far the most viewed in my channel's history, and while I hate to boast, is now YouTube's first result for the search term Proxima B. As such, I feel I have something of an obligation to ensure that the information I provide on this topic remains relevant and accurate. And there has been a lot of information on this topic recently. Most of it, shall we say, somewhat presumptuous. Many followers of this topic have already completely written off Proxima B as a possible abode for life. Proxima B is a flare star whose violent outbursts, according to a NASA climate model, would eventually deprive any orbiting planet of its oxygen. I am not, by any means, an optimist, and even a cursory glance at the history of planetary discovery should be enough to dampen anyone's optimism. But there is such a thing as undue pessimism as well. Speaking in my apparent unofficial capacity as YouTube's ambassador to Proxima B, let me make one thing absolutely clear. We don't know anything about Proxima B. Okay, that may be too glib. We know some things. We know that it orbits the red dwarf star Proxima Centauri once every 11 days. We know that it is larger than Earth, but almost certainly no more than three times larger. We know that its orbit is less elongated than that of Eris, though not by how much. And that its equilibrium temperature, or its temperature if it lacked an atmosphere, is somewhere between 220 and 240 kelvins, or about 15 degrees below that of Earth, while the amount of starlight it receives is about two-thirds that of Earth. That's it. Everything else, its composition, its history, its dynamics, its atmosphere, and anything we could glean from them, is, fundamentally, speculation. Based not on what we know the planet is, but on what we don't know it is not. Is it a super-Earth or a mini-Neptune? Is its composition primarily rocky or icy? Did it form in place, or did it migrate inward or outward early in its history? Does it have a magnetic field? And if so, how strong is it? If it is a terrestrial planet, is it geologically active? How thick is its atmosphere, and what is it made of? Does it have continents, or is it an ocean world? All of these questions play profoundly into whether or not Proxima b is a life-bearing planet, and we don't know any of the answers yet. Which is why I particularly like the latest paper to model a potential Proxima b. Published last month in the journal Astrobiology by Anthony Del Genio and colleagues, not only is it the first to simulate a dynamic ocean, with currents, eddies, and waves, it also covers a vast spectrum of possible atmospheres, from the nearly Earth-like to the almost Venus-like. The resulting worlds created in this simulation are complex and varied, but I can say at least one thing about all of them. Bring your mittens. Del Genio et al.'s Proxima B is, at its core, the same world hypothesized by the group at the European Southern Observatory that discovered it, discussed in my first Proxima B video. A rocky world with a radius of 7,127 kilometers, compared to Earth's 6,371, and a surface gravity of 11 meters per second, compared with Earth's 10. The planet is assumed to possess no seasons, both because of its markedly short year, and also because tidal forces from its star would have minimized its axial tilt. The modelers refer to their principal world construction scenario as control. Control possesses an 11-day orbit and is in synchronous rotation with Proxima Centauri, meaning that it only ever shows one face to its star. From its surface, its sun hangs motionless in the air. The planet possesses no day-night cycle, and noon, twilight, and midnight are not times, but locations on its surface. Control receives about 65% of the energy from its star as Earth. Its atmosphere has a surface pressure the same as Earth's, at 0.984 bar, 
and is composed mostly of nitrogen with CO2 at 376 parts per million, which is slightly less than Earth's current level, though higher than its pre-industrial level. The simulated atmosphere is 40 layers tall and tops out at 1 millibar. The ocean is 9 layers deep and bottoms out at 900 meters. A deeper ocean was deemed unnecessary as any climatic responses it generated would have been on a scale longer than Proxima b's 11-day orbital period. The ocean's salinity is initially established as identical to that of Earth. As with previous models, control is assumed to be an ocean world, with no islands or continents. The previous models, which had relied on static oceans, did not account for heat transport around the planet, and as a result produced what have been termed eyeball worlds of habitable substellar noon regions surrounded by frozen twilight and midnight regions. Control's addition of dynamic ocean currents creates a far more complex model, which the paper calls the lobster, but I think better resembles a fighter jet and contrail. This is due to a cyclonic equatorial current that carries warm noon water not only through the tropics, but also into higher latitudes. A temperate paradise, however, control is not. If you look at the bar at the bottom, you will see that the somewhat anemic colors represent a maximum temperature of barely above freezing. You can see this far more starkly in the ice cover image, which essentially carves the current out of an otherwise entirely frozen world. What is fascinating is that the ESO's model assumed merely a static ocean and slightly higher sunlight, and found an average sunside temperature of 27 degrees Celsius, higher even than Earth. On the plus side, if it could be called that, the ocean currents keep the night side far warmer than predicted in the model discussed in my second Proxima V video, in which the night side air was cold enough to flash freeze your lungs. Much like the previous worlds, however, and which I forgot to mention in my previous video, the noon region would experience wind velocities approaching 60 meters per second. That's the force of a Category 4 hurricane all the time. This vision of hell frozen over proved remarkably resistant to alteration. Raising the amount of starlight received to the levels used in the initial model by the ESO, about 70% of Earth's, produced an almost identical world, with only a slight fattening of the equatorial ice-free region. Reducing the atmosphere to one-tenth of Earth's, of course, vastly increased ice cover. However, Increasing the atmosphere to ten times Earth's produced a world that, while certainly more clement than control, was not substantially different from the ESO starlight version. Even granting Proxima b a land surface similar to our own did not substantially change the overall picture, given a few concessions to topography. Though it is interesting to note that adding land creates isolated regions where the average temperature lies above not quite freezing. Surprisingly, Replacing the atmosphere with a CO2 level of 990 parts per million and adding 900 parts per million of methane, an atmosphere akin to the Archaean Earth, did not substantially shift the temperature or climate patterns, and in fact produced greater sea ice cover. This counterintuitive result is only possible on an alien planet. Our star, the Sun, produces light mainly in the higher wavelengths we call the visible, which pass through the atmosphere like a window and are absorbed by the Earth. The Earth then radiates the energy back as infrared radiation, more commonly called heat, which is then trapped by the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. However, Proxima is a red dwarf star, which radiates mainly in the infrared. Therefore, an increased amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere would trap the majority of light coming toward the planet and prevent it from reaching the surface. The upshot of this is that granting Proxima b an atmosphere of pure CO2, akin to that of Venus or Mars, would in fact produce a remarkably clement world, similar to that of Earth. As with the previous models, the team ran a similar simulation for a Proxima b with an orbital eccentricity of 0.3, making its orbit about as elongated as Pluto's. Such a world would, like Mercury, orbit its star in a 3-2 resonance. For every three revolutions it makes around its star, it spins twice. The net effect of this is that, from the surface, the planet experiences one whole 11-day year of daylight, followed by 11 days of night. As with previous models, this produced two opposite poles of solar absorption, which created a relatively constant band of higher temperatures around the equator. But perhaps the most striking result came when the team increased the salinity of the oceans to roughly that of the Dead Sea, within the tolerance for the most extreme halophiles on our planet. The resultant hypersaline world not only possessed a more uniform surface temperature, though it never exceeded zero C, but also displayed ice cover not dissimilar to that of our own world. Salt, 
as anyone who has ever had to travel to work on a snow day knows, decreases the freezing point of water, and salting Proxima B's oceans allows it to retain an Earth-like climate at very non-Earth-like temperatures. Adaptation to hypersalinity, called halophilia, does not appear to be an obstacle to developing complex organic structures. Many halophilic organisms on our world, such as brine shrimp or brine fly larvae, have already made the leap to multicellularity, and if they can do that, what's to stop an entirely halophilic ecosystem from emerging? Assuming that it had managed to produce a viable terrestrial biosphere of multifarious megafauna and megaphyta, a hypersaline Proxima B would be a fascinating place. Great tropical forests, lush with black, red-adapted foliage, might straddle its equator, and populated with the same heat-adapted animals we'd expect from our own jungles. And yet, we would stand shivering beneath the black forest eaves, feeling the rain as the blast of a Scottish winter, left choking and stung by the salt, as bedraggled as if we had survived a shipwreck in the North Sea. And here, of course, I must again fire off my clarion call. We don't know anything about Proxima B. However complex the models used in this instance may have been, they were still calculated from base assumptions rather than actual data. And data is what we need. New telescopes are coming online fast. We may get that data sooner than we realize.